and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a returning good brother to the temple, the man behind the many, many shades of vengeance, of which every time I say it, I, I end up thinking of screaming for vengeance, I don't know why, Cre creator of the Era series, or met meta series, I suppose I should go with these days, and is returning to the consortium with a new wave of expansions currently on Kickstarter. The one and only Ed Jowett. How you doing? How you doing today, man? Or Hello, close to... Mildred, I am doing fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just thinking. I've I've obviously heard your heard your intro a couple of times now, and it just occurred to me. I wonder if this does count as one of the drunkest ways possible of seeking enlightenment, like role playing <laughs> games in general. Or... <laughs> I, I I've never really thought of it that way, but given the way most people play at like a convention, I can kind of see it. I um, I will not deny that I, that I have go that I have gone to at least one se I've gone to at least one session or DM'd one session drunk. Uh, that that there is a particular individual, and if you're listening, Chris, I'm thinking of you. <laughs> um, uh, who uh, I I'm pretty sure spends the entirety of my favorite convention drunk. Um, mm -hmm. and he runs sessions, he plays sessions. Doesn't doesn't seem to bother him too much. But uh, I'm 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 not sure whether I've ever met him sober at this point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the only thing I have to worry only thing I have to worry about whenever dr whenever drinking gets involved in certain conventions I've been at is whether or not someone's going to sing Margaritaville, which don't. <laughs> fair. I, I mean, I I think I think that's probably probably a fair comment is i can always th i can always threaten one um uh, one of the people at my table with the paint with um the pain glass if yeah, they the if they ever you have two options one is to drink a bottle of bacon soda Ugh. the other is a shot glass filled with water salt sea salt pepper black pepper Tabasco sauce, tiger sauce, Frank's red hot sauce, and sriracha. I think I'd probably go for the latter, but there's not a lot in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, like like I said, it is. So, I I use the bacon soda as a backup in case I have one of my southern friends over because, well, yeah. they're gonna have a higher higher uh, tolerance for spicy. But they'll be all right. Yeah. <laughs> I did use the one chip thing on them once. They couldn't handle that, so I've got that in the pocket. No. But I know I know it's been quite a hot minute since I've ha since I've had you in the temple. How have you been? How have you been holding up of late? Well, uh, it has been a little while, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. um, uh, I've actually had a lot of changes in my life. Uh, my my son has been born. I think since we last spoke. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's obviously changed, changed a few things around here. Um, but I'm still creating. Um, I've published a couple of novels now. Uh, third one on the way. Um, I've been doing comics, audio dramas, and of course, as much more in the, in the world of role-playing games as humanly possible. Mm -hmm. On top of all of that. And then, also, I just finished, uh, writing and publishing a book about how to be a better writer. Mm-hmm. Um, good, good fun that project. the The idea was it's a it's a choose your own adventure book like those old like those old D and D books they did. And um, instead of like getting to a dead end in the story where your character dies because you made a bad decision, instead you run into writing mistakes. Mm -hmm. So you know things like uh, oh, there's this random Deus Ex Machina, and that will end your adventure. And then I'll spend a page talking about why that doesn't work, what you could do instead, that sort of thing. Um, you know, rather than fall into these common writing mistakes that a lot of people who are newer to writing make. Mm -hmm. uh, that one just that one funded on Kickstarter quite recently. 
Um, I'm just waiting for the print run now, but uh, it shouldn't be too much longer now. I expect it within the next few days. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, I've started uh, this new Kickstarter for Era of the Consortium, as you mentioned at the beginning. Um, Universe of Expansions 3. Mm -hmm. Now, what you might not know is it's actually our 8th anniversary um, this month. Well, congr so, congratulations uh, on 8 years of Consortium. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and of course, Era of the Consortium was the was the first game that I created. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we, we, we have 13 expansions existing. Uh, we look set for another somewhere between three and six, depending on support, mm -hmm. um, which is fantastic. Um, we've got a living campaign running. Uh, which I think I might have spoken to you about last time. But in case anyone's yeah. listening, quickly, in summary, um, anyone who wants to submit a session can do so. Mm. Um, there's, a, there's a page on our website. Uh, if you actually just Google Era the Consortium Living Campaign, it comes up mm -hmm. at the top of Google. So uh, that's nice and easy to find. And uh, the idea is that you can play a resistance group or a consortium group and uh, gradually, zones of control over the various planets in the consortium will increase or decrease for each faction. Now, at the moment, um, I've got to be honest, the consortium are kind of dominating. Mm -hmm. um, it's funny because uh, more resistance sessions get submitted than consortium sessions. Um, but obviously, the consortium are in the right and the resistance are just upstarts. Mm -hmm. So, um, <laughs> I'm obviously joking. Um, but it seems that every single time that we run a big event where there's, a, where there's an opportunity for lots of things to change, for example, at, at the convention I mentioned earlier, we'll run a multi-table game, uh, three tables, three sessions. So there is a possibility for nine points of shift. Mm -hmm. And it seems like every time the consortium does that, they win, they succeed. And every time the resistance does it, they screw up. So it's just kind of like, despite the fact that the Resistance seems to get more games played, um, the Consortium are actually winning quite substantially at the moment, which is, it's, it's very funny to me. I, 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 find that, um, I find that very interesting as a, you know, a, a, a sort of a commentary on the way people play role-playing games and mm -hmm. the way that they sort of approach situation. So, you know, if you think you're the consortium and you think you're being evil, um, then you, you obviously play the game in a certain way. Whereas if you think you're being a righteous hero, then you play the game in a different way. And from the outside, being a righteous hero doesn't always look like being a righteous hero. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, ultimately, what means that they're losing is actually propaganda war. Uh, the consortium has managed to spin most of what they've done as, as sort of, uh, you know, some terrorist attacks and that sort of thing. Um, and, uh, and, and that's been exciting. That's been going on for two, three years now. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and, you know, anyone who plays here with the consortium can submit a, a, a session and they're very welcome to. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, but uh, but you know, there's there's always more stuff for me to build in in era of the consortium, and uh, this Kickstarter is about bringing a few, uh, you know, initially bringing a few more sessions to people so that they can play without having to do a lot of prep time. Mm -hmm. um, particularly since my son was born, um, I've found that not having to spend a long time preparing games to be able to play is actually really important. Um, so having these pre-made sessions so I don't have to think about it, um, I can just go ahead and pick one that I like or, or follow on a campaign uh, that's already been written. Um, it's just really, really helpful and allows us to play continually, despite the fact I don't have a lot of prep time. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I have to assume there are other people in that situation. There are other people who... There, there are people who come to me and say, I GM, but I'm not creative, and... I kind of go, oh, I don't think that's actually a possibility, but let's talk about what your problem is. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, some people really appreciate this and find it very helpful. Yeah. So, you know, initially there are three three campaign books, one full of sessions for the living campaign that you can run, mm 
uh, one which is uh, a continuation of the time travel campaign. That's a long-running campaign, that one. Um, we've got four parts of it out already, but you can leap in at the beginning of any part and sort of pick up the story and enjoy it. Uh, mm. Because each part is a different generation of the same family. Or families, I should say. Mm -hmm. uh, there are five different families. They travel back in time to change the consortium to what they think it needs to be to survive the future. Mm. And, um, you know, so each of them have their chosen descendant that is the... Um, uh, that, that's kind of the, the operative that, that, that the player plays as. And the idea is that you don't play as a player you, you know, or as a single character, you play as the dynasty of characters in, in order. Mm -hmm. And then finally, um, there's a period which was quite underserved, in my opinion, in the rulebook, in the original version of the rulebook, much better in the definitive. Um, but immediately after the bug war takes place, we have a, a Starship Troopers-esque um, bug war within the history worth quick worth quick aside obviously many of your listeners and, and yourself you already know this but mm -hmm. um, others might not so era of the consortium is it spans 500 years of history within the story but the idea isn't that you sit down and just read that history it's not it's not supposed to be a, a history textbook the idea is that you jump into the right point in history for the subgenre of sci-fi that you would like to play mm-hmm so if you want to sort of be the first colonist on a planet, you sort of go in right at the beginning. Or if you want to explore space, you go a little later. Or if you want to do the Starship Troopers-esque bug war that I just mentioned, you go a little later than that. Um, you know, you can uh, go and have a check for... Um, uh, just go in, in the future a bit more and, and, and uh, do sort of the, the emerging cyberpunk technology, you know, the, the implants that change what it means to be human and interface mm -hmm. with your brain and what does all this mean um you can do some transhumanism stuff where people are not quite so you know they're, they're a bit more enlightened um and they behave a bit more yeah transhuman mm -hmm. um you you can do sort of uh a, 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 the living campaign is kind of based in in the era where there's sort of a star wars thing of the the great big evil empire the consortium um, and the resistance which are fighting against it. And, and you know, you can play in any, you know, that, that's only a few examples. There's actually a full double-page list in the Definitive Edition rulebook mm -hmm. um, for all of, the, all of the different time periods you can play. And um, you can, uh, you know, hop in where you want to go so that you play your subgenre that you want to do. Now, what I wanted to do, and, and as I said, I felt it was underserved, is after this, this Starship Troopers-esque bug war, the Zimians surrender at the end of the war. Uh, the, the bugs surrender. Mm -hmm. And um, they're integrated into consortium society, but not really very equally. Uh, people are still afraid of them. Um, they consider themselves to be... You know, to have surrendered unconditionally to the consortium, so they'll just do whatever they're told. So, but in order to sort of do a symbol, a political symbol that the war's over and everything's okay now, many of them are taken to uh, the homeworld of the consortium, Tyrannus, and they're placed in what they call Zimian-specific areas, uh, which uh, obviously most other, um, well, the two other races that currently exist in the consortium aren't, you know, they don't live there. You know, the Zim only Zimians are housed there. Mm -hmm. And um, the idea of this campaign is you play as one of the your security, I guess, police officers who are required to keep the peace within this Zimian-specific area. Mm -hmm. And, you know, while they in general have this view that they've surrendered and they should do what they're told... It's weird, because, you know, they have their culture and it works differently... And they haven't really been told, no, 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 you can't execute your culture. They're basically locked in these XSAs and, and you know, left to their own devices. But your responsibility is to make sure the community doesn't come apart at the seams. You know, riots don't ensue and people break out. Um, and it's a 10-session campaign sort of exploring that idea and following it through. Um, it's actually a really fun campaign. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't had the chance to run it. Uh, but a friend of mine has, and uh, 
he he said his group absolutely loved it. Yeah. And thing is about all of these, um, I like mm -hmm. to add new mechanics mm -hmm. in for all of them. So for keep the peace, for example, um, there are mechanics around how you approach each situation. You can gain points with um, uh, with like the 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 company you work for, which wants you to crack down on the on the Zimians and make their lives a misery. And then, you know, if you do that, then maybe you get, like, better weapons, for example. And, um, you know, you could be a community hero. And if you're a community hero, then maybe the community sort of rises up to help you when you're in trouble. You know, there are going to be members of the community who help you out when otherwise they wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Or you can be sort of the strictly to the letter of the law. Think um, Judge Dredd. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, this is the law, I don't care, this is exactly what the law is, and you can have other benefits related to that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, everyone knows that you're fair, and if you turn up and you apply the law, and every time you've ever applied the law, when you've been in the XSA, it's been absolutely to the letter of the law, everyone knows you're fair, and they're not going to sort of, they're not going to try and lynch you for, for applying the law. Mm -hmm. So there's all kinds of different, sort of, three main different directions that you can go in order that your play experience is actually different depending on the choices that you make in each session. Mm -hmm. So that, that, was a, that was a really fun idea, and uh, I'm, I'm really glad to be able to bring that to life now. Yeah. Now, it's funny that you, interest, that you brought up time travel in regard to that, since time travel is one of those things that's a bit of a minefield when it comes to doing so in store in story form and e and just as much when it comes to role playing and even st even time travel stories that I like can sometimes fall under their own weight. Yep. Yeah, that's that's definitely a danger. Um there's so I, it's funny you should say that because I've also just finished producing a comic called Melcart that is entirely a time travel story. Mhm. Mm um and and I have a play with some of the things you can do around time travel just just for fun, really. Mm -hmm. um, and what I what I find is that you need to set up the parameters of time travel to make it work, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, with this time travel campaign, um, the the parameters of time travel are very simple. the The first generation of this family were raised. Not to think about what the future is. I didn't even really learn what the future is. They were just taught what what had to be done to change the past so that the future would be, in inverted commas, right. Mm -hmm. Now, the first generation don't really think about this too much. They just do what they're told and, you know, their, their implants go ping every so often um, and say, no, you need to go and do this now. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. Okay, we'll kill that random dude. That seems a bit fine, whatever. Uh, you know, they must know best. Now, obviously, when you get, you know, a teenager who picks up this, you know, you've got your teenage, early 20s rebellion, you know, your, your parent has said, no, 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 you have to do this way, the, the future is depending on you, and you're going, oh, what, really? Hmm. Is, do I agree with that? So you kind of have this wonderful little dynamic of... Okay, so you're told what the future should look like. No, you're not told what the future should look like. I'm sorry. You're told what events you need to modify to make the future the way whoever sent your great-great-grandparents back in time. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever they wanted. Okay. How much do you trust that? How much do you believe that they knew what they were doing? Because changes have already been made. So the timeline is already not what it was in the first place. So do you do you do what you're told? Do you use your own judgment and think about something different? Do you mm -hmm. try and do, use sort of the obviously in their implants they're given um, sort of a, a, a kind of inspired by psychohistory from the uh, from the Foundation series. They, they they've sort of got a means of broadly mapping out what the future's going to do based on the changes they've done. You know, do you remap the future and make your own decisions rather than trusting what you were sent back in time with? You know, with the instructions you were sent back in time with. Or your great, again, great, great grandparents. So it's one of those things that grows during the campaign, which is a wonderful, fun little toy 
to play with for the for the players. Because, you know, to start with, it's unquestionable. Okay, you go kill this dude. That's going to stop this thing from happening. Okay, you go and make sure this person is in the right place at the right time so that this thing happens. Okay, cool. Awesome. And you sort of go through a few sessions like that. Mm -hmm. Great. Awesome. Then the kids take over and you're kind of like, okay, well, they're quite strictly brought up and, you know, they're, they're, you know maybe they're a bit more, you know, maybe they're more inclined to follow what's been given because, you know, the mysticism has been instilled into them quite strongly from a very young age. But over the generations, you're going to dilute that. There's nothing much you can do about it. So that's kind of what we decided to play with. And by the time you reach the bug war, which is 184 years after they time traveled back um you, you're kind of like fifth generation they're being told implant you know m make new implants and get them into the brains of a bunch of the aliens so that you can rile up the aliens and make sure the bug war happens the way you want it to mm -hmm. what really like what Yo, know, and, and, and the players are starting to ask questions at that point, like, is this definitely the right thing? And we've included a framework there for if they go slightly off the reservation or even a long way off the reservation. Um, the idea being that you can bring that element in throughout the generations. So much, so much fun. This, this campaign, I have had the chance to run a, a good chunk of. Um, and, uh, and it's a lot of fun to, to, to bring those feelings in gradually of but we're the smartest people in the world are we really just going to follow what we were told mm -hmm. so yeah that's that's quite interesting that's quite an interesting one i think yeah now with that in with that in mind with the th with the um three expansion books well min minimum three mm. um that's being covered with as being covered with this particular campaign. Um, were these a collection of ideas that were in the that were in the back of your head, a reflection of the um camp the sessions that you had done, or somewhere in between? Somewhere in between. Um, so keep the peace was an idea that someone else came up with actually, mm -hmm. um, and then wrote with me in cooperation. Um, uh, the, the actual mechanics around it were actually from another, I made them for another era game that has not yet materialized. Now I haven't entirely, I haven't entirely ruled out the possibility that game might materialize one day, mm -hmm. but we're not quite there yet. Um, and I thought, Hey, the opportunity to, to bring these mechanics out and let people have a play with them. That's invaluable if I'm going to try and try and make this new game. Mm -hmm. And then the time travel campaign, that's sort of... I've run a large number of sessions from it, and we're, we're now, you know, this is sessions, technically sessions 41 to 50. Um, and uh, that means that we're sort of looking at it and going, okay, I haven't run all these sessions yet, mm -hmm. but where do I expect this to go? You know, so it's sort of grounded in sessions I've run, but sort of extending that off the off the top, as it were. As for the living campaign sessions, I've run a large number of them. I I want to lower the barrier as far as possible, but I, I think the living campaign is quite a special thing. That's why I spent so long talking about it earlier. Um, I think it's quite a special thing to be able to influence the universe, and really, you can influence the universe playing that campaign. Mm -hmm. And I want to lower the barrier to involvement as low as possible. So the logical thing to do is produce sessions that anyone can play. I've run several of them myself, um, but many of them are completely repeatable. You know, you, you could just play them yourself and, and submit again, and it would have an additional effect based on the thing. Because, for example... Um, the resistance needs more people to help train its warriors, right? So go to this space station and bring the people, you know, bring trainers from the space station who've said they might be willing to defect, you know, convince them to defect and, and, and bring them to the resistance to help train the soldiers. Now you can do that over and over and over and over again. Like if 10 people submitted that, that would be absolutely fine. 
because mm -hmm. you know they could be training in different things or whatever you know it's not it doesn't need to be a problem we're training different sets of people you know that there, there are enough fighters in the consortium that you need a lot of trainers mm -hmm. so you know the the living campaign I, I want everyone to feel like they were able to shape the history. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's a very important thing to me. Every player who's played with me uh, on a on a you know era of the consortium living campaign session has been made fully aware that you know what they've done is they've changed the situation. Mm -hmm. You know they've they've increased or decreased the control of their faction um, based on their actions. Yeah. So I I, I think that's a I think that's a relatively unique thing. You don't see it very often. Um, and really, the, the world can change based on what people do, not just, oh, well, that's just kind of a thing. The, the, the world will actually change based on what they do. Mm -hmm. um, which is... yeah, I, I don't know, for example, what the situation's going to be when the living campaign ends and we move on with the era of the consortium story. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I, I actually don't. I mean, I don't know if Selena Hayden, the head of the the biggest company in the consortium, she might have been assassinated by then. It's it's a possibility. Like if someone wanted to run, I'd probably require a campaign for it to not be a body double if you just do it in a one shot session. Um, you know, but you know, if if someone wants to run a campaign purely dedicated to killing her off, fine, okay, do that. Um. And I will, I will adapt the future of the consortium based on what people do, and mm. that's what I've been doing. Um, one of the uh, uh, not last year, not sorry, not this year, but last year in January, I ran a I ran a multi-table campaign where uh, the resistance aimed to have one planet declare complete independence from the consortium. Um, and as I already said, the resistance uh, multi-tables tend to go horribly wrong. So it went horribly wrong, um, mm -hmm. and they failed. But there, there was a genuine opportunity for this gas giant and all its moons to just go, yeah, we're not part of the consortium anymore, and if you try and come close, we're going to blow you out of the sky. Mm -hmm. um, now, as I say, they failed. Uh, they had every opportunity to succeed, but they uh, they screwed up, basically. Um, and uh, And they were forced to retreat. But that... You know that obviously would have shaped things very differently moving forward, if the resistance had their own planet that was just not involved in any way with the consortium. That that would change things. Um, so that kind of change is completely possible, and it's something I would encourage people to do. And I have encouraged people to do it. Um, there was a there was a space station that was used as a military deterrent guarding the wormhole. Big, 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 big mass driver guns. Mm -hmm. And um, it got destroyed. There was a the, there was a three session campaign, and most of the people got off. But there was a three session campaign by a group uh, that basically allowed them to go on board the station and blow it up. So now there is no space station defending this jump gate. Nothing stopping military craft from coming through, uh, apart from whatever small military detachments the consortium can spare. Which mm -hmm. is nothing like what it used to be. It can be broken through. Mm -hmm. um, so for the first time, military ships of the Resistance can get from another system into this system. So that's a big deal. Yeah. So yeah, there's loads and loads of cool stuff. Mm -hmm. And given the amount of moving parts with maintaining a living campaign and how and how that's and making sure that people are able to have a have a impact in the story. How do you maintain that without getting overwhelmed or feel like you're sp you're um, spinning place to the Benny Hill theme? <laughs> um, my technique is very pragmatic. Um, what does a shift of one point from resistance to consortium matter? It doesn't, right? Um. If a planet goes... So so there are... I, I really ought to know this. This is a bit embarrassing, and I don't know how many how many places there are. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. So, uh, 26, 27. 
So there are 27 different locations in the consortium. And if one goes all red or one goes all blue, then it matters a lot. But other than that, the exact details don't change very much. So um, Tyrannus right now, or, or Labonus, the, the planet they tried to liberate, they've got their all consortium except for one blob of resistance. Now that means if you're the resistance and you go there, you're probably going to run into searches, you're probably going to run into patrols, because they think they own this area. Mm -hmm. um, there are also planets which have gone into full consortium ownership. Nothing's gone into full resistance ownership, but full consortium ownership. They've managed to basically purge the resistance from their world. Um, many of those have gone into lockdown and don't allow people in and out. Uh, it's a couple of space stations and small moons. Mm -hmm. um, and they just don't let anyone in or out. You know, what they have is what they are going to get. They don't trade with the outside world, apart from very carefully inspected and checked things. I even wrote a, I even wrote a session um, where you... Uh, it was... Um, oh, what's that computer game called? Very old computer game where you check people's passports and make sure they're allowed to come in. Papers, please. Papers, please. It's and I made, I made a session for Era of the Consortium inspired by Papers, please. Mm -hmm. Um whereby you are Smirtios security customs agents who have to make sure that no one comes in who isn't allowed to on one of these locked down worlds. Mm -hmm. um, which is, that, that was a lot of fun. I, I ran that session and everyone had a complete ball. It was good fun. Um, they, they, they arrested, uh, they, they arrested a, a Hayden Bank representative because she refused to tell them what she was doing. And then, like, half an hour later, they got the call that, basically, they're being disciplined for arresting this person. <laughs> because they, they sh absolutely should not have stopped a member of, you know, a, a representative of the most powerful company in the consortium, no matter what, whether she was saying what she was doing or not. It's, it's one of those kind of, you can, because it's a, because it's a GM-led game rather than a computer game, you can be a bit unfair... Mm -hmm. You can be like, yeah, you're, you're being disciplined for this choice that you had no idea there was any way you could have known this. Mm -hmm. um, but you can be a little bit unfair. You can be a little bit sort of, oh yeah, well, you were supposed to read, you were supposed to read the GM's mind at this point, and it doesn't really take away from the session because it makes it again feel like there's an impact of what they're doing on themselves, their future, and also on the world. Mm -hmm. So, in answer to your question, I've kind of gone around the houses here. I focus on the pragmatic view of what's going on. Is this planet nearly all resistance? Okay, if you're a consortium person and you're going there, you're likely to get raided. You probably don't want to go into out-system Acalmus. There are too many people who are against you. And, and you, you know, it's a bit risky. So you don't want to go out there without, without being on a warship, mm -hmm. right? You want to be ready to defend yourself. Equally, you know, if you're a consortium person going to a consortium safe station, your problem is not likely to be resistance members attacking you. It's likely to be internal intrigue in the consortium, like my company wants your company to fail um, or look bad because that's politically expedient for us. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of options there for anyone. And I don't need to worry about the minutiae too much. I can go in and look at it and go, okay, well, the broad sweep is this. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, the broad sweep is very much the resistance are being kicked out. They're being turned in by their, you know, by the sort of the people in the middle ground have been convinced that the resistance mostly just go around blowing things up. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're gradually sort of kicking everyone out because they don't want you know, they don't want their biodome blown up and them to, you know, they don't want to die. So, um, you know, the resistance need to do something quite serious. Um, I've got one of my, one of my GMs, um, I can't wait for this session to actually happen. One of my GMs is working on a resistance charter. Uh, they're going to have a session where everyone gets to sort of talk about what should go in the resistance charter about what they're trying to do. Because mm -hmm. at the moment, the resistance sort of want to overthrow the consortium but their messaging on what they're going to do instead is very unclear. 
and the population in general is very against democracy because they've had 400 years of being told it's bad. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's, um, I should say the consortium is a financial meritocracy. Um, it's run by the top 200 companies, um, uh, based on profit. Mm -hmm. They make up the Senate. And then the top eight of those make up the big eight, who are the most powerful companies. Hayden Bank, which I've mentioned a few times, is one of those. Smurty or Security is another one. Um, I've mentioned both of those during this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, the entire population has been convinced that democracy just lets populist leaders come to power who have no interest in actually making civilizations prosper. They only have interest in, you know, enriching themselves or having power for themselves. That's what they've been convinced over these four centuries that the consortium's been in existence. Mm -hmm. Now, with that in, with that in mind, mm. oh, given the given the um, given the amount of events that ha that have happened with the li with the living campaign and just and just with the whole set setting as a whole, oh, bit of a tautology there. One thing that I'm curious about is the pitch, because meta meta uh, meta narrative is always one of those things that is a divisive matter when it comes when it comes to RPG design. There's there are some benefits and there's some drawbacks to it. Yep. And a common thing that I end up that I would hear with say. The meta narrative with with um something like Shadowrun or something like I'd say BattleTech would e would be an even bigger example of this kind of thing, is that there are so many events that are already set in stone, that th that um somebody coming in doesn't know where they're going to be able to squeeze their character, or their their particular story, into events. Um, you know, give, given that, how do you make sure that people would be able to jump? Right into right into the story that is the consortium. So that's a question. Um, it's something that I thought a lot about, and what I did is rather than so, let's look at uh, the Bug War for example. Mm -hmm. Right. So you want to do a Starship Troopers esque game, okay? And you go, okay, well maybe Era of the Consortium is the right game for me. So in the Bug War, what is a set thing? The bug war starts and a certain thing happens. A small group of people go to the home world of this alien race and they all get ripped in half uh, and massacred and that starts the bug war. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's set. Um, the consortium send a fleet to bombard this race. It takes about six months to get there. For travel reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, when they arrive, the Zimians uh, use uh, kamikaze tactics. They, they suicide into the, into the side of the ship. Big ship blows up. That's set. The, the consortium realizes that, that um, the, the, the Zimians are going to attack them. They'll trace them back eventually, um, and they will come through the wormhole and attack. Mm-hmm. The fact that they attack a year later is set. Um, the fact that certain developments are made at certain points during the bug war, which lasts eight years... No, 18 years, I'm sorry. Um, it lasts 18 years, and certain developments are made at certain points. They create heavy armor, which is driven by... Well, or boosted by mental... You know, the, the neural interface with, with humans. Mm -hmm. um, they build big robot mechs called disarms those have dates when they're built and delivered mm -hmm. and then there's a final there, there, there are a couple of final actions that take place towards the end of the war that are pretty set in stone now during that time the Zimians spread out through a whole solar system the consortium beat them back down to their own original little moon um and no stories are told particularly. I mean, there is a story now in actually the time travel campaign um, of, uh, you know, the, the, what the war was like on the ground or in space. You can tell your own story there. You can take, okay, 
Um, they they spread from Essos to Belisama, and I'm going to have my campaign take place on Belisama. And the aim of the campaign is drive the Zimians off Belisama. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Go ahead. Absolutely nothing that says what happened or didn't happen there. You know how many people died, how many people, you know, ha- how many people it took to get the Zimians off Belisama. How significant their presence was on Belisama. What the bug war provides is a scaffold with many, 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 many big gaps. Mm-hmm. The tentpole events just make sure, you know, the, the war started. There was an attack. It failed badly, so it wasn't a one-sided war. There was a counterattack. It was barely defeated. Technology was developed. Um... They and and eventually they win the war and the Zimian surrender, as I as I mentioned before. Anything in between any of those events is completely up to the GM. Mm-hmm. No one is going to be able to tell them they're wrong because it doesn't say. So for me, that and 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 to to sort of circle back around to directly answering the question, the reason I've gone into that level of detail is the answer is certain key events must happen, like the. Think of it a bit like Doctor Who describes time travel, right? Mm-hmm. There are fixed points in time that you can't mess with, otherwise everything pretty much does come crashing down. Or you have but bats trying to eat you. Or, or you get bats trying to eat you. Um, uh, funny, I was just talking about that to someone yesterday. Um, the, uh, the, the, the art in developing a timeline like this, and, and indeed... You know, I've talked about the bug war timeline, but the same is true of the whole 500 years of history, and that's only 18 years in there. Um, the art of developing it is to put the key points in that matter and don't try and put fixed points in where you shouldn't, where, where people need the flexibility. Mm-hmm. And although it takes a little bit of time to understand that that is what needs doing. That is the primary thing that I think I have achieved with Era the Consortium. You know, like, like, yes, all of, you know, I've created a massive sci-fi universe. That's a, you know, that's the thing that I want to do for me. But in terms of the actual gameplay, the choice of where I've put the key events and where I've not put key events is actually the most important thing about the universe, in my opinion, mm-hmm. for the actual gameplay in real life. And that's the same reason, sort of, that comes nicely back to what I was saying about the Living Campaign, about how I only care about these large shifts in what's going on. Mm-hmm. Now... What will generally... Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so, sorry, go ahead. Oh, go, go ahead. I didn't, I didn't know if you had finished. <laughs> no, I, I was sort of pausing. Mm-hmm. What, what, what's... The, the pattern that I tend to follow, and it's not entirely true, but the pattern I tend to follow is there's an inciting incident, there's something responding to that, and that may be days later or it may be years later, depending on the inciting incident. Mm-hmm. And then there's a couple of milestones which aren't... Like, the development of technology, that's not going to affect your campaign very much. You know, uh, again, let's take this example of you want to do uh, you want to do Belisama in the Bug War, right? Um, you know, uh, oh, uh, new delivery. You've got new armor that's better than anything you've had before. Awesome, but that doesn't really affect your campaign, right? It doesn't change the way that you're playing. Doesn't change the story. So there are these milestone events that that occur, but don't really. No matter what you're doing, they're not going to affect. They're not going to affect your story that you're telling. Although they may make your life easier in gameplay. And then finally, you've got a finishing event. Mm -hmm. And the finishing event is the end of the war. It's not the end of your fight in the war. It's, you know, that can be however you like. That's kind of the point. Um, But people have to know where it starts and where it ends. And I've also had um, an occasion where someone went, no, I'm I'm not going to let that happen that way. I'm going to step in and interfere. And at that point, the GM can sit down and look at... Because there are these fixed events, you can look at it and go, how does this fixed event change as a result of what you've just done? There's there's a card game called Chrononauts. You aware of it? You know that one? 
I know of I know of an RP I know of an infamous RPG called Chrononauts. I am familiar with the no. card game, but not as much. I was just. I don't think the card game's related. I don't think. Um, no, they're different. No, the yeah. name it. They're different things. It's just the RPG yeah. which had the subtitle "Role Playing in the Yet" was um, an infamous hidden gem, and then people lear- then people learned how it actually worked, and it um, wasn't good. <laughs> Unfortunate. There's, there's a card game called Chrononauts, where the idea is, basically, you're all from some kind of alternate timeline, and you have to change the timeline to get back to your own time and be able to go home. And that's kind of the way I imagine this. If you map out the, the fixed point events in your future, and you go, no, 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 we're not going to make peace with the Zimians, we're going to massacre them all. Okay, so the GM can then go and look at those fixed points at least the next couple, and go, well, that doesn't happen that way. That happens this way instead, surely. You know, you can... Most GMs can work out pretty quickly how you adapt those fixed points, and you continue on on your own branch timeline. Mm-hmm. Maybe it comes back to the... Maybe it comes back to the main timeline eventually. Maybe it doesn't. But I've had people do that and go off on a branch for some time and then actually come back in again. Uh, which was which was quite an interesting, quite an interesting application of the you know of, of the concept, which I hadn't really planned. Mm-hmm. So, I hope that kind of answers your question. I've sort of gone around the houses a bit. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, and to be fair, these. Qu- it's not like these questions that I ask are are sim are simple binary ones. They never are. Well, those are the boring kind of questions, right? Uh, yeah, the... I mean, it would be a rather boring conversation if you just went, "Is the consortium good?" And I went, <laughs> yes. Well, fortunately, I know I don't do the boring questions around here. I do the I do the I do the hard I do the hard hit I do the hard hitting questions. At least I think they're hard hitting, but <laughs> Mildra, Mildra, the hard hitting gumshoe monk. I'm not wearing a deer stalker. Ah, oh, well, you see, that's the mistake, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, where? Yeah, how how long am I going to get away with that in in the winter? Is all I'm saying. Uh, yeah, good point. <laughs> oh. I'd prob I'd probably wear one of those Eastern European hats. Oh. oh right, yeah, 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 right. The uh, yeah, the fur hats. Mm-hmm. Yeah, keep your head warm. Is it get it gets January gets nasty around here. Does it? Yeah. But we've, we've we've had very mild weather over here. Sorry, I mean yeah. I can talk about weather all day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that yeah. Everybody, everybody I've ever I've ever spoken to in the UK is always whenever I tell them the weather in during the winter in my end, they're like. How do you live in that? Uh, yeah, well, my sister lives in Canada, so uh, yeah, I, I I I do have some concept of what the weather can be like. <laughs> yeah, but um, when I looked at some, when I looked at some of the when I looked at some of the potential stretch goals, as well as some of the poten- uh, potential other materials, what there was one that did stick out to me, and that is the company handbook. Uh-huh. Is yeah. the is the idea of people founding and re- founding their own company something that um, people had been asking you about for a while? Funny story, actually. Um, some time ago, there was a um a, a relatively famous within RPG circles uh, writer uh, named Darren Watts, mm-hmm. who I got in touch with, and you know we sat down, and we said, okay, let's. Let's do a project together. And um, he, well, I asked him what he would what he would want out of Era of the Consortium that isn't currently in it. I figured, uh, you know, if, if you're going to get someone in and you know they, they want to do a project with you, then then let them do the project they'd like to do, right? So he said, well, what I'd really like to have, or what I'd really like to do, is um, sort of I'd like to have discovery of a new new set of worlds. 
And uh, from that came the expansion New Worlds. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that, you know, that was an expansion that, that we sat down, we planned out. Um, he wrote and I edited. But he actually sort of did more work on this than I was expecting. And he actually, at the same time as doing the New Worlds, he wrote up some suggestions for rules and some stories around the same group who discovered these New Worlds creating their own company to, to profit from them. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought, well, I mean, that's, that's a great, great idea. I love the idea that you can create your own company. Um, I love the uh, I, I love many of the rules that he came up with, and a few of them needed a tweak. Uh, most of them needed a bit of an era D10 tweak because they're a bit more uh, generic. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, like like a few of them need needed a bit of changes, but uh, mostly they were pretty solid. And I went, okay, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put New Worlds out because New Worlds is great and it adds to the meta plot and it you know it's 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 fantastic. But I'd also like to do the company handbook. Um, and that is where we can put the other half of this story for these people. We can do the stuff about making their own company. We can do the stuff about, uh, you know, what what it's like to enter the intrigue of the Senate and be one of those top 200 companies. And indeed, what you would need to do to get there. So, you know, after 400 years, obviously the top 200 companies, many of them are very mature companies who have remained there for a very long time um, and, and they're going to be rather hard to unseat because they do basic services like food, right? Which you, you're never going to reduce the amount of food that you need. So, okay, yeah, that company's pretty much set for life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, these, this advice goes to talk about what you, what you need to do to get into the Senate, what Senate politics are like at the lower levels, um, and all of those sorts of things. And like I said, it, he kind of wrote it all as one book, and I didn't entirely agree with that that choice. So I, you know, I decided no, 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 I'll split it in two. That's fine. We can have one that's about exploration and you know discovering new planets and all that kind of stuff. But not everyone will want both things. Mm -hmm. Was basically the concept. So some people will want the. You know, we'll, we'll want this, uh, you know, we'll want this company handbook and some people won't. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel like imposing that you must have the company handbook in order that you can do exploring worlds makes any logical sense whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So that's how that ended up. Um, and it's a, it's a great little book uh, that we've got. It's sat there. It's not quite ready. It needs some artwork and it needs quite a lot of artwork, actually. And it needs some, you know, some love, some time. Mm-hmm. But um, it's it's uh, it's a really nice it's it's a really nice idea, and it's something that I would very much like to deliver. Um, as you pointed out, it's a stretch goal that's kind of off the top of the chart at the moment. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I I would very much like to get to the point where I've got some budget to to put that together and deliver it. Mm -hmm. And. With that, with that kind of thing in mind, when it came to, because I, when it, I know you mentioned, I know you mentioned writing, um, writing some new mechanics for keep for keep the peace. Um, when it came, how do you make how how easy or difficult was it to make it so that the camp that the mechanics that you're adding into that would st would um not would not interfere too much with uh, with other additions or create power creep because that's always a concern with any long with any long running RPG project. So I think that the the way that I look at this is there are a lot of ways to slice a universe, right? And mechanics around um the way in which a community react to you don't have to have any impact on power creep in terms of combat, for example. Mm -hmm. What they might do is give you access to more weapons. They might give you um, access to 
more intelligence or, or, or you know, informants, which affect the story rather than the mechanical aspect. Mm-hmm. I, I think that if you ended up with a situation where you're a community hero and your weapons kind of suck, but you've got, like, a bunch of Zimian workers who are going to jump in anytime there's a fight, you know, that you're involved in. They're going to jump in and help you out because, you know, generally you're a community hero. That doesn't necessarily have to mean that there's power creep for you because you're kind of compensating with, yeah, but you also didn't get the plasma cannons. I exaggerate slightly. You, you can't get plasma cannons and keep the peace. But, but, but the point is, you know, you... you you can balance that out quite easily. And I think that when you're adding new mechanics, it's a question of what are you adding those new mechanics for? Are you adding them, or, or, or new equipment, or whatever? Are you adding this to give people more gradation? Because the, the, I'm sure you will have noticed the Armoury is mm-hmm. one, of the, um, one of the books. Yeah. Uh, that's on offer here. Um, and the idea is to give loads more weapons. But the idea is not that you can have better than the best weapons. The idea is to give you different weightings. So, oh, I'm really sick of my handgun because I can never hit a target with it. You know, I don't really care so much about damage. I would do anything to be able to hit a target every time with my handgun and then take the risk on the damage roll. Okay, well, I can't offer you an every time but I can make it easier for you, right? I can I can improve the situation. Um, however, you'll pay for that in other stats. Maybe it'll be heavier because you put a scope on it. Maybe it'll be less damaging because you have lighter rounds so that they fly further better. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you can tweak other things. I've actually written... Um, I uh, One of the projects that I also think I've mentioned to you before... Um, I write a quarterly zine called The Era Zone. Mm -hmm. And in one of the most recent issues, I actually sat down and went, okay, GMs, I understand that you might want to, you know, you might want to change some stats on characters, on weapons, whatever. That's absolutely fine. Bear these facts in mind. Like, for example, lowering damage threshold kind of makes a weapon pretty godlike. Be really careful about doing that too much. Um, you know, here are the kinds of things you can penalize if you want to do it. Um, but the idea behind the armory um, is pretty much in line with what I think you're asking, which is, what's the difference between a rifle and a carbine in mechanical terms? Mm-hmm. In, in, era de- in era of the consortium specifically. What does an assault rifle give you that a carbine doesn't and vice versa? Mm-hmm. Um... And how does that say differ from the shotgun, uh, or, or maybe there's a maybe there's a pump action shotgun versus an auto shotgun? Mm-hmm. What, what you know? What what are the trade offs for these? That's the kind of thing that that where it can get a bit hairy. But in general, when you're making rules like oh, how does your how do people react towards your company, or or how does the community react towards you? I think that there's a different dimension to those rules that means that broadly you're okay, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Until you start, obviously, slicing that same dimension a second time. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. Now, if I'm... Would I be... Now, if I understand it, um, the baseline for the three books is going to be around 150 pages, correct? Uh, total, yes. So, with that, with that in mind, since we we have about a week, we're in the final week. Um, mm-hmm. I would pl- I would play the final countdown music, but Ar- <laughs> but um, Archon beat me to that with it with his project. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, what are you shooting for as far as a release window for the for the expansions? Quite well known for over delivering. In the general sense, I, mm-hmm. I usually deliver a good distance ahead of where I've said. Now, these three books are written, edited, and um, I'm working on layout with someone at the moment, and then they're going to need to be proofread, and some of them need some cover art, and some of them it's done. 
Mm -hmm. um, those three books, I would be quite surprised if I can't deliver them by the end of June. Mm -hmm. um, I've committed to August. Um, I think that's more than reasonable. But I, I, I strongly believe that I can get that done quicker. Um, and that includes the, the first two stretch goals as well. The, uh, the Living Campaign extra pages. So there are extra, extra sessions in the Living Campaign book. And uh, the Keep the Peace campaign, the extra Zimmy and NPCs. Those pretty much completely rely on me just sitting down and doing Photoshop on the character sheets to make them and writing the character backstories and so on. So I can control that fairly easily. They need proofreading, of course, but um, you know, I, I can, they're very, very heavily within my control. Mm -hmm. Now, the deck of characters, uh, Encounters on the Edge of Space, if we get there for the 2,500 stretch goal, which mm -hmm. is uh, only about 400 off now. Um, if we get to Encounters on the Edge of Space, uh, I'm pretty confident it'll be a similar time scale. Um, the Armoury or the Company Handbook, they would take a bit longer, I'm sure. I wouldn't want to commit to August without looking into it m in more detail exactly what I need to do, and also being certain that I have an artist who will do the work to the satisfac sorry, mm -hmm. to a satisfactory standard for me. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the consortiums always have the highest standard of artwork, and I, I don't plan for that to change. Yeah. And I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how that plays out. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for coming back to the temple and enjoying the particular bit of madness that happens around here. It's an absolute pleasure, as always. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's always great being back here, and I hope to be back here again before too much longer, to be honest, because mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's always good fun. Yeah. And as you say, you don't ask the easy questions. <laughs> and I like that. I... I should say, I, I and, and, and to anyone else out there who has a question, maybe is thinking and, and not asking, I'd prefer you ask me the difficult questions. It's a challenge, and it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to just have everyone nod along with me and say everything's okay. I want people to challenge me and say, hey, why have you made that decision? Because that's the only way you learn. It's, mm -hmm. it's the only way you learn that maybe you made a bad decision, right? Um, it's the only way that you realize that there are better ways of doing things. Um, one really good example, and I've complained about this a few times to a few people, possibly even yourself. I am not happy with the initiative system in Era D10. I don't like it. Um, it's sort of your default initiative system. Roll one dice, add it to initiative. You know, everyone does it that way. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's intuitive for Era D10, and I'm not happy with it. Um, I'm looking into what I can do uh, that is in keeping with Era D10 and is sort of is the kind of thing that I would like. But I, you know, I'm, I'm not happy with it, and the only reason is I ran the game enough times and I said, roll initiative, and before I explained it, people have picked up seven dice to roll it. You know yeah. what I mean? It's, it's mm -hmm. kind of like, I had to see it being done wrong to realize that, you know what, actually, Ed, that's a... You know, it might be what everyone else does, but it doesn't mean it's the right thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, if, if you're out there, if you're listening... Um, Hop on the Kickstarter, ask me a question. I am happy to answer. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's I think it's really important to challenge people who are creative. And if they can't give you an answer, then they can't give you an answer. And I'm going to be honest about that. I'm just going to go, oh, yeah, uh, I need to go and think about that. Or, you know, I didn't really have a reason. It just seemed like the right thing to do. Or I might go, ah, I can't, can't explain why. Sorry. Um... But whichever, uh, please challenge me, ask, um, say, are you sure this is the right thing? Or, uh, you know, ask, as you have, actually, Mildred, I think my favorite question from you today is uh, about the timeline and about how you make sure that people aren't too restricted in what they want to do. Yeah. Um, it's a good question. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it needs to be asked, that kind of question. So, yeah, thank mm -hmm. you very much. It's mm -hmm. 
again, very long and rambly. It's a pleasure <laughs> to be back. It's really nice to be here mm-hmm. and, and, and chatting to you. And I appreciate that you're asking these kinds of questions because I want to answer them. Yeah. And if I can't answer them, I want to know I can't answer them. Mm-hmm. Oh. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Uh, certainly if you have to listen to me for an hour. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>